Welcome to Taste Buds. I'm Deborah Eckerling, goal strategist, writer, and foodie. And today I'm speaking with Michael Weissman, author of The Rye Bread Marriage and other books and articles and so many things. So welcome, Michael. Thank you for joining me. It's a pleasure to be with you, Deborah. Truly a pleasure. Thank you. Let's start with the book, Rye Bread Marriage. Why? And okay. Yes. Okay. So what do you do if you're a writer? And you're married to a guy who was born in Latvia and is obsessed with uh, Latvian rye bread and stays obsessed through, you know, your kids, you have kids and they grow up, all kinds of decades of your lives. And one day, literally, I woke up and I said to John, my next book is going to be called The Rye Bread Marriage. By this time, John, who, as I say, is a refugee and was a scientist, um, is a physicist, was trained as a physicist and was a professor of electrical engineering, had started a teeny weeny little company that marketed Latvian rye bread up and down the East Coast. And at first it was the bread was imported from Latvia. And then they found um, that he and his partner found a baker in Brooklyn who, a Russian Jewish baker actually, who could bake this bread. The rye bread in question is quite unique because Latvian rye bread is both sweet and sour. So it has a little sugar and a little, you know, sourdough, a lot of sourdough and a little sugar, but it's also made with 100% um, rye flour. There's no wheat in it. And this is quite extraordinary, although it's quite extraordinary except in the Baltics and Scandinavia, where that's the kind of bread that many, many people eat. So... John was selling that bread. I was sometimes going to Whole Foods and pitching it, you know, handing out samples myself. And I had never really loved this bread, but I was starting to get the idea that it might be something special because of the way people responded to it. And so then I woke, I literally woke up one night that I had uh, my last book, which is about um, the specialty coffee industry had come out. And I had for that, I had followed some young coffee buyers around the world and had many, many adventures. And so I said, oh, well, the rye bread marriage, we're just going to go traveling in Eastern Europe and I'm going to write a book. Only this time, instead of these young guys, these young coffee dudes, I'm, my, my husband will be the star of the, you know, the, the star of the drama. And well, you know how books are. And as my wonderful, wonderful, beloved agent, book agent said to me, when I turned in many drafts that really did not sing, she said, well, you know, Michael, memoirs take a long time. And I went, oh, am I writing a memoir? Oh, I thought I was just writing a narrative, a food book. So anyway, it, it developed. This is what I love about the show. So it's taste buds, it's food cooking and community. And I get to interview people who are not necessarily chefs, but who love food and bring it out in their work, which I think you are a really good example of. It's where did, when did you get like that, oh, this is the story I'm telling. When was that light bulb? Uh-huh. Um, I, I read some chapters that didn't work, and I had some material that I knew was beautiful. Okay, by this time, this is like five years in, I have some chapters about first-person material that really works, but I don't have, it doesn't, it doesn't cohere. What is our life got to do with the rye bread? And, and um, I went to a writer's retreat and I met some people who were really seminal to my life. And one is a woman I, I began to teach with. And one was a guy who was a professor in California. And we, at this event, um, uh, at this uh, retreat, we, the three of us did a reading. And after I read some very pretty funny material about John and me meeting, my friend Paul put his hands on my shoulders and he said, Michael, you're going to be okay with this book if you stick with the bread. And I suddenly realized that I had to weave everything I was telling, the story of John's family and their sort of remarkable um, flight across Europe and the story of our family and the story of our family's love of food, that it all had to be woven with the bread. And that, and, and what opened up to me halfway through is that the bread is a is a food and a beloved food stuff with its own story but the bread is also a metaphor for our marriage 
and con- and just connection. Um, and so it 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 um, like well, as if it were wheat bread and it would rise magnificently, but like, as if it were wheat bread, but it it was not. It was rye bread. It rose and it and it and the and the um, and the flavors and the aromas kind of uh, started to merge. And I and I invented a technique for telling these very diverse stories, but always coming back to the bread. That was that was for me a real creative triumph to figure out how to tell this story and to keep people interested, because um, bread has a thirty thousand year history, and no reader, no matter how devoted, wants to know all of those 30,000 years. They want a story, and I found some stories, or a story. So there. That worked. Good answer. Good answer. And in a really good metaphor, too, because the bread does need to rise, and sometimes it rises several times. I know usually two, three. Yes. Some people leave it longer. And so your book was like a loaf of bread that just needed punching down and reinvigorating absolutely and it needed um you know with the rye bread i mean you keep adding um more starter you add starter and you add you might add rye 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 buds you might you know you may do several different interesting things in the process of the 24 hours or more that it takes to um to make a loaf of latvian rye bread but there's there's one other piece about all this that I, it, long before I fell in love with rye bread, but when I had fallen in love with John, I used to say I married him because I knew with him I'd never go hungry. You know, we share a common love of food and food and food shared, not just consumed in a piggity way, but really shared with loved ones. That's, that's the, you know, that's this huge bond between us. I love it. And, and so, you love rye bread now. I do. I've come to, I have really, well, there's nothing like researching something and going deeper and deeper into the history. Well, and, and, and I learned to love the taste when I opened myself to it. And the early in our marriages, in our marriage, the rye, the Latvian rye breads I had eaten were baked by amateur bakers, including my mother-in-law. And and using stoves that are, you know, home stoves that don't go up much over 500 degrees. This bread, in order to um, create this beautiful crust and to caramelize and all the Maillard reactions and all that technical stuff, you need a, a 900 degree oven and then you bring it down. So once I started having bread that was really properly uh, baked, I could taste the beauty of it. Um, and then it was so much fun when I start. I started writing about food fifteen-ish years ago. Before that, I was a generalist, and you know what? Sharing this food with our foodie friends was also just so much fun because people would flip out. And you know, in our fancy, fancy world, things like you know a bit of herring. You know, a, a square of rye bread and a tumble full of ice cold vodka. Um, it 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 um, it is um, orgasmic in the pleasure that that it can that c- it can induce, and it's so much fun to share something that's unique um, with people that you really en- enjoy. So, is it come for the rye bread, stay for the story, or come for the story and stay for the rye bread? Oh my, I, I, you know, it's the snake that's eating its tail. I don't know where one starts and the other begins because, um, yeah, I don't know where, I don't know where they, you know, it, they're, they're, they're so interwoven. Yes. And, and now to, to, to raise a different bread, you know, it's, it's like my life is a challah, <laughs> you know, a braided challah. I just think that what I figured out in terms of the book is that my stories were braided together. And when I think about a braided bread, I actually, I don't think of rye bread. I think of a challah and a, you know, a, a special, holy, beautiful braided bread. But it, it, it is um, the stories, the life, 
the love, the guests, the children, um, the richness of it all is all braided together along with, see, here's the beautiful part, along with braiding together John's past and present because the bread as served in our house and our, ch our, our children, our grandchildren all teethe on it. The bread brings together and kneads together and braids together John's past and the, and the flight, his flight across Europe as a child and his present, which is very much an American guy with, you know, has had a very good career in science and all that. But until I joined him in his love of rye bread, he his his love for who where he came from and his love for where he was now were 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 de woven together. They were they were separated, and now thanks to the bread, and now thanks to this book in a way, they have come together. And um, that's an incredibly sweet um, gift for both of us. Well, I think especially we live in tumultuous times. Yes, I speak in understate. Uh, but I feel like lessons can be learned from bread bringing people together. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, here's the perfect part. So my grandmother was born in Belarus, about 300 miles from the farm where John's parents were born. Because um, his parent, my, my grandmother was younger. His parents were older when they had him. And I always had this hunch that, um, that our ancestors, even though I'm Jewish and he is not, and there has been some enmity between non-Jews and Jews in Eastern Europe, that, that our grandparents and his parents, we all ate the same bread. And it turns out that in the course of researching and writing this book, I found out that, of course, the Jewish rye that most American Jews think of as de Jewish deli rye is a very much an Americanization of rye bread. And then, in fact, it is true that in the shtetl, the shtetl of Schlutz, where she was born and lived for her first nine years, my grandmother ate a dense, 100 percent rye, sweet and sour bread that would last for weeks so that, you know, you, you would cut it and and um, um, it could last for three weeks, if, except that people were hungrier than that. But and it was this, and um, there's a wonderful food historian, Stanley Ginsberg, who has written several books on rye, and he has the sources to prove this. And so in the course of writing this book, I discovered that we were um, kinsmen in the sharing of this bread. Or our grandparents, like our grandparents and his parents were. So that was, that has been a source of tremendous delight. It feels very Bashir. You know, you even through the windy road, you both were meant to be to have that connection from generations before to now is amazing. What lessons do you think people can learn um about the value of breaking bread, sharing a meal? Oh, well, what you say means so much to me. And the life that John and I have built is a life um, built around the table with food shared with family and friends. And um, even before there was rye bread, as there is to the degree now, that we have now, there was always the sharing. And I mean, our, our, I, I love John for his hospitality and his generosity. I mean, and it had never occurred to me in a way that my mother was a wonderful cook and my father, my father was a very clever man, but he didn't really like to eat all that much. And he certainly didn't want to feed anybody. And I, when I met John, I was just blown away by his desire to give you what he loves. And that's, we built a family and a life together, built around sharing what we love at the table. And 
it can be the simplest thing. You know, it doesn't, it can be, um, you know, chicken chili on, on, you know, on top of brown rice. It can be, um, you know, it can be holiday dinners that are, you know, quite glamorous, but, but, and, and especially I love to make all kinds of eggs and, you know, it can be, it can be uh, scrambled eggs and rye bread, but it's the come to our house and we will give you what we love and we will make time to be together and sit together and, and get to know each other better. And many things change as you age. Um, some for the better, some are a little bit of a challenge, but this piece doesn't change at all. The joy of getting to know a new friend or spending time with an old friend and giving them something delicious and, you know, nourishing in the deepest sense is a pleasure to last a lifetime. I always think that families have to be about, are often about something, the best families, and some are about classical music, and some about hiking and kayaking, and our family is about this. It's about gathering friends at our table and sharing um, what we love, and frankly, I can't think of a better thing to, to build a life about, around, so. That's beautiful. I love that, and I have to ask you, this is still a food podcast. Is there a recipe that you love that you would like to share? Yes, there definitely is. And it definitely relates to what I just said, because I have a theory about dinners when you invite people for dinners. I always do make three courses, a first course and, you know, but in dessert, of course. But but I have come over the years to um, champion first courses that are very elaborate, are composed salads. And I compose these salads because... I don't want to jump up after five minutes and change the soup bowls. I want my guests, even though it's the first course, to begin to get to know each other, to be relaxed and leisurely. And I have found that if you make a big, I, I mean, I make a big composed salad and it's very beautiful. It has golden beets or maybe red beets and it has uh, um, pomegranate seeds and it has maybe a little fennel and orange and walnuts and maybe some cheese. But, you know, it's just, it's, it's not a lot of work. I mean, it's a little bit of designy work, but it's really not a lot of work. But the, the secret is that if you serve such a thing as the first course, people will take second and they might even take thirds and yet they're not too full to eat the rest of your dinner. And I love that because the dinner starts immediately. The conviviality starts immediately. You don't have to wait. Um, and I, as the host or half the, you know, half the host team, I can sit down and enjoy the salad because I am not going to have to jump up in three minutes and change the plates. So, and I make, um, I must say where I am very classical is I make my own vinaigrettes and I make a, so I have this recipe and I'll send it to you. It's got, I make the vinaigrette with a little bit of the orange juice from that orange and a couple of different vinegars. And you can use one kind of vinegar. And I always use chopped shallot and some honey. Honey is great. Here's a secret. Honey is wonderful for any vinaigrette with fruit. And there's a hack. If you put honey in your vinaigrette, all that work of beating the Dijon mustard and the, and the, um, and the olive oil, there's no work at all because the honey literally jumps together with the other ingredients and, and it's done before you start it. So what? Well, it sounds delicious. I, I really love this conversation. I thank you so much uh, for sharing this love of food and community and where everything comes together. Uh, where can people learn more about you and your book and your love of all things food? Okay. Well, there's a couple of places. So I'm on Instagram. And there's lots of stuff about me in my book. And I also have a website called um, michaelweissmanwrites.com. You know, and um, there's lots of articles I've written, lots of information about my other books, about my coffee book and my other books and all these articles. And there's pictures of John and me. And I think there might even be a picture. There might be a picture of a salad, but there might not be. But but you're what you're making me think is I need to put a picture of my salad on that website now that I've told this story. So I'm gonna do that. And if you go to jewishjournal.com slash podcasts, you will get the highlights as well as the wonderful salad recipe and dressing from 
Michael Weiss said, uh, is there something you know now about either baking or cooking or food or whatever that you wish you knew? When I was younger? Yes. I had inklings because of my mother and grandmother, but what I know now, it's about love. And when I go into a little store or a little restaurant or a neighborhood store where they do takeout and they're doing a beautiful job or a gelato shop or, or people come to my house or I go to some people's houses and I just see it. It's about love. It adds an entirely different dimension to the food because, but some of the love is about the quality of the ingredients, but it's also about the, um, the eagerness to share. So I didn't know that. I thought it was performative. I thought it was, you know, I thought it was going to be fancy. It's not about fancy. It's about love. Awesome. What a wonderful point to add on. Thank you so much, Michael Weissman, for, for sharing your love of all things food and rye bread and the way that it has been interwoven, much like a braided hala. So thank you. And thank you for tuning in to Taste Buds with Deb. Don't miss an episode. You can subscribe on YouTube and or your favorite podcast platform. And again, go to jewishjournal.com slash podcast to get the recipe and read the articles that go with each episode. And you can learn more at tastebudswithdeb.com. Until next time, bon appetit.